Raghi Omar has sent us this report. Our correspondent Raghi Omar is there tonight. I'm returning to the city I reported from at the beginning of the Iraq war. The very heart of Baghdad. Uh, it's raining now, it's literally raining mud. When the invasion began in 2003, I was a fresh-faced correspondent full of ambition and fear. This is what shock and awe looked like as it tore into Iraq's capital. But just think of those ordinary Iraqis living near these targets. Five years on, I want to find the ordinary Iraqis who were my friends back then. Everyone knew war would bring tragedy, but could anyone have predicted that a country could unravel so drastically? This is as much a personal quest as a professional assignment. The years I spent here from 1997 onwards left me with a lasting affection for Iraqis and their country. But what's it like now? For so many here, the last five years have been a lifetime. In 2003, the Palestine Hotel was home for me and dozens of colleagues. Today, it's deserted. It was from the hotel roof that I filed my first reports of the war, witnessing the land invasion as American troops advanced alongside the Tigris River. They met little resistance, and time was clearly up for Iraq's feared and hated dictator. is moving at will across whole swathes of Baghdad. People have come out welcoming them, holding up V signs. This is an image taking place across the whole of the Iraqi capital today. The US tanks converged on Firdu Square, where Saddam's statue stood. One person stood out from the crowd that day, the man with the hammer, symbolizing the Iraqis' rage against decades of dictatorship and their relief that it was now over. Kadem al-Jabouri had been a weightlifter, representing Iraq at a national level, but he'd fallen out with Saddam's sons over a business deal and was sentenced to nine years in Abu Ghraib prison. Revenge came on April the 9th, 2003. I began to hit without even thinking about it. The lads from the neighborhood helped me, first just 50 or 60, then 100, and 150, the numbers grew. They were watching my back because more and more secret police and Saddam's commandos were coming into the square. They saw me, but the guys and all the journalists were shielding me. Then the Americans arrived, and the tanks came into Ferdos Square. I too was there on that memorable day, as excited as any onlooker. In the beginning, everyone was happy to have got rid of a tyrant and his oppressive regime that had destroyed the Iraqi people, made them slaves and imprisoned or murdered them. Everyone knew history had been made that day, and everyone wanted their own memento, including me. Today, a nondescript piece of modern art has taken the place of Saddam's statue. But what's replaced his rule? Democracy, America and Britain will argue. Lawlessness, many Iraqis will tell you. When we had elections and the government started taking shape, the militias started killing. Things got worse and I began to change my mind. It was far worse than the two previous years of occupation. 
While Saddam was a killer, a criminal, he did give us security and opportunities for business and work. Now I don't know whether to feel happy or sad. A short while later, I was on a lower roof of the Palestine Hotel, preparing to file a report. As I did so, a French television crew were filming this tank. When American tanks opened fire and hit this balcony, I lost a friend, Ukrainian cameraman Taras Porchusk. We tried desperately to get medical help for our colleagues. But in these series of attacks, several journalists have been killed and wounded. It's very strange and eerie being back in this room five years after finding Taras Prochusk dead on this very spot. He'd been filming the American tank on the Jumhurir Bridge, which then fired on him. There was pandemonium and blood everywhere. And I remember thinking to myself that this was the worst day for journalists covering the Iraq war, but none of us could have foreseen how many other journalists would come to die in the five years after that point, the vast majority of them Iraqi journalists. Another friend staying at the Palestine survived the shelling, and he's been reporting from the front line ever since. It's been a very long time. Yeah, you look just really Fala Khaibar is an award-winning yeah. news photographer. Come sit down. Come sit down. It's really good Thank to see you, you Fala. Five years. Yeah, five years. Five years. A long time. Before the war, life was easy and safe. We had a home and a car and a settled life, and most of all, safety. Now it's gone. Hmm. There's no doubt that life is harder, because every day you run the risk of being killed. Iraq's become so dangerous for Western journalists reporting here that they rely on locals like Falah. 128 journalists have died in the Iraq war, most of them Iraqi. 17 have been killed by coalition forces. When there's an attack against US troops, you can't move around. You don't know who your enemy is anymore. That's why as a cameraman or journalist, you've always got this element of fear. Even the Americans arrest us and confiscate the photos on our discs. What I've seen is that they're destroying the country. There's no agenda, no plan that you can see. There's looting everywhere, life has been destroyed. Strong views, but from a man who's witnessed the events of the last five years at first hand. Farlas photographs provide us with poignant, sometimes harrowing images of a people still experiencing violence and fear every day. Women in particular have suffered from the lack of safety. Saddam's regime was brutal, but it was secular. Since it was removed, religious fundamentalism has been on the rise. Many basic freedoms, from education to employment, are now denied, and violence against women in the name of honor and religion has become commonplace. The collapse began as soon as the killing and looting started. Women began to feel frightened. Female students were afraid of continuing their education because they could be kidnapped. Several times cars taking girls from home to the university were seized. Women were terrified and even the men were afraid of allowing their wives or daughters to go to the market. Dalala Rubai is a brave woman. She campaigns publicly, demanding support for women who have lost their home or income. So many sons and husbands have been displaced or killed, she's seeing more and more women taking desperate measures to survive. In 2000, 
200 prostitutes were murdered one way or another. That wasn't all of them, of course, and now there are thousands. Families have no choice but to sell their daughters so that they can eat. Why? Who's responsible? All those who took part in the war against Iraq. The Iraqis I meet no longer see the coalition forces as an army of liberation, but of occupation. Promises of security, reconciliation and a rebuilding of the country remain unfulfilled. At best, they feel confused by foreign armies on their soil. At worst, hatred. <laughs> 